So, good morning. Sorry. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Maybe a good afternoon uh, for someone. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce today's uh, speaker, Josia Sparks. Josia is a distinguished mathematical statistician at the United States Census Bureau and also serves as an adjunct uh, professor at the George Washington University. His research expertise lies in applied uh, probability with a special focus on random discrete structures. His work investigates the complex asymptotic behaviors of random trees and ear models. Lucia's research also extensively employs Martingale theory, spectral decomposition, and analysis of algorithms, through which the, uh, he explores probabilistic insights into uh, evolutionary models. His studies extend to areas such as genetic dispersion and the dynamics of random networks, making his contribution both highly technical and deeply relevant across various scientific domains. Today, Russia will uh, present on the affin KSB urn scheme, multicolor affin urn models with multiple uh, drawing. This talk promises a fascinating look into multicolor affin urn models an area that offers rich mathematical uh, challenges and uh, insights with applications across probability theory and algorithmic uh, processes. Uh, please join uh, me in welcoming Joshua Sparks, and please, you can uh, start. Hi, I'm Thank you all. Where is the ledger? Where is the ledger? Thank you all for coming. Um, so my name is Joshua Sparks, uh, and my talk is on affine KSB urn schemes, the multicolor affine urn models with multiple drawings. And so the idea of this urn model can be constructed fairly easily. We'll take an urn, let's say a container that is filled with n balls comprised of, so n1, n2, all the way up to n sub k balls of k different colors. And then we can structure the model by drawing a number of balls at random from the urn and record their respective colors. And this recording itself can model various probability distributions and construct it under discrete or continuous draws depending on how we format our structure. Uh, please, Josia, uh, if I mm -hmm. can uh, ask a question at the beginning of yes. this talk. The, the number mm -hmm. of uh, uh, drawn balls is uh, uh, random or deterministic? So it can be random or deterministic, yes. It could, is dependent on whichever. So in my, our case, my case, it'll be something that is deterministic. But there are, there are papers out there that do a random number of drawings as well. Okay. So in your talk, the number of drawn balls is deterministic? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, so a traditional description of it may be, has often examined the idea where you draw a single ball at a time. In such a case, we'll have a scenario that if a ball of color i is drawn from our urn, we'll add m sub i j balls of color j into the urn, whether m sub j, where m sub j is an integer for j from one to k, and the values m sub i j could be either deterministic or could be randomized. So the number of balls that are being added into the urn or, take, or taken away if it's negative can be either a deterministic component or it can be done as a randomized variable. And if we let M be the replacement matrix associated with this urn as described above, then M is basically a square K by K matrix of the form where we have M sub one all the way to M sub one one to M sub one K. And we will construct the idea of the whether you draw color one through color K denoted by the rows and then the replacement criteria denoted by the columns. And what represents the first line of this uh, matrix, please, if you can uh, so, give some explication. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in this situation, we have uh, a construction where if I were to draw a ball of color one, so we denote our, our colors one through K, if I draw a ball of color one, this M, 
then would M11 would be the number of balls of color one we're either adding or removing if it's negative. Uh, ball M12 is then the balls of number of color two where we're adding or removing all the way up to color K. And so then we go to the second row would be of the criteria what happens if we draw a, color two, a ball of color two all the way down to the ball of color K. So if in your sample, if you, in your sample um, drone, you have mm -hmm. two balls of color one, you add two M11 balls of color one. Yes. Well, it gets a little bit more complicated. I'll, I'll get to that. So when we have, uh, so this is only the case. So this is the structure of what happens when it's color one. So in this case, it's a square matrix. When we get beyond draws of one ball, all at a time, then we're going to get something that becomes um, the replacement criteria, the replacement matrix is going to be rectangular in nature. So when I draw two balls of color, you know, one ball of color one, one ball of color two, then we get something else. The, the replacement matrix becomes a little bit different. So I'll show that in just a second. Okay. Um, so some notable two color examples that have been like, Kind of foundational for the literature, the Paulia Eggenberger urn, the Friedman urn, for example, or the Ehrenfess urn. In these cases, where Paulia Eggenberger is basically self reinforcing, that if I draw a ball of color one, then it's adding U balls of color one into the urn itself. If I have a Friedman, and then color two also basically repopulates. So it's like basic, a great uh, analogy I like to use is like if you're planting a garden. Well, if you have a couple of species of plants that are fighting to grow, because one of them can only be chosen to populate based on resources of the soil, then the random, the random chura is kind of like which of the two um, genetic dispositions ends up growing and prospering from the plant seeds. So the Friedman urn is something where it's sort of um, opposite reinforcement. So like we can have, we typically saw it in the case where U is zero and V is some sort of positive integer. So we see like sort of an opposite reinforcement where if I draw something of color one then color two comes out um, and vice versa. So I think it's like play the winner cases are often a situation of Friedman urns. And then Aaron Fest urns is, kind of, is a special case of zero balance models where if you kind of approach the Friedman urn with the idea where you take away uh, balls, take away that ball when it's being drawn and sort of go to the other side that has its own structure associated with it. So every time you replace the drawn balls in the urn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So the drawn balls are replaced in the urn after every step. After every step, yes. So after each draw, we have the replacement criterion where we see sort of the, the evolution of the urn happen after each draw because there is a different condition. Likewise, the probability, in this case, I focus mainly on balls that are drawn uh, uniformly at random, but there are preferential treatment urns that could also be dealt with, where if you have so many balls of color one versus so many balls of color two, maybe there's it's not just sort of which one is greater, but maybe there's a certain weight associated to these balls based on the number in it or based on the color that we're dealing with. So examples in literature would include schemes with dealing with random replacements and that sort of dynamic changes, uh, clinical trials, infinite colors. So in our case, we'll focus more on a finite color scheme, but there are there's research that deals into the idea of what infinite colors would mean uh, and also the idea of continuous processes where maybe we associate a clock to each of the balls. Um, in a previous work that I did with uh, Professor Mahmoud, uh, Mahmoud, then we were able to associate an, uh, an exponential one clock to each of the balls. If they, and then the, basically the first one that goes off, then we have the replacement criteria on it happen there and then we reset the clocks. Now, all those things are foundational to single color research. When S becomes greater than one, so when we start sampling more than one balls at a time, 
the dynamics of our urn sort of change. For instance, our rows that are generalized to represent draw outcomes of a single color then becomes an idea of samples and that our A matrix that used to be square now it becomes rectangular because we no longer have um, draw outcomes of color one, color two, color three, K different outcomes. Instead, based on the number we sample S and the number of colors we have K, we end up getting S plus K minus one, choose S different possibilities. So it, all the number of samples that could be done brought, are brought in by that number of rows. And then we have the same number of columns, K, because then basically on the sample that we pull from, then there's the same sort of column-based row replacement criterion given the sample that we are constructing. We, another component to take in consideration, we also need to qualify whether our sample is conducted with replacement. We often see it called model R um, or without plate replacement um, called model M. So I think Kuba and Shen sort of didn't find this about 10 years ago when they were dealing with um, essentially a scalar or the Paulia Eigenberger urn with multiple drawings when you have K different colors. And the replacement matrix, because it's now rectangular instead of square, some of the techniques that were previously used, such as a traditionally spectral decomposition of M into its eigenvalues I, in giving an eigenvector Jordan decomposition, this no longer applies because we're now we're going to deal with this issue with uh, rectangular matrices. Now, there are there is research out there that sort of provides a more computationally focused solution through stochastic approximation. Or whatnot. So the, the purpose, um, keep it within the same sort of idea of an analytic approach that is done with a one, one ball cases. And one of the nice uh, classes of urns that happen from multiple drawings comes from what's called the affiner. So M may be rectangular due to multiple drawings. If we have this, what we call, and I'll describe a little bit more later, an urn that is affine, then the replacement matrix that we are constructing actually has what we call a core matrix, A. It describes the replacement criteria when all M balls are sampled to be of the same color. We'll refer to the ith row of A as sort of, as sort of a sub S, and then like the EI is just the traditional um, vector from a standard basis, standard basis vector. So if I say E1, that's where it's one in the first spot, zero elsewhere. If I say E2, E sub two, then that's zero, one, and then zero is elsewhere and so forth. This A row is also the same case of what happens when you have a sample S where it's all the same color, from, and it's a replacement matrix here. So basically it's the idea of this is the smaller matrix or of a sub matrix that you can pull from, extract from M such that each of the rows that are constructed to make A is just the criterion that happens when you sample all balls of color one or all balls that are coming from color two or all balls that are coming from color three. Now given that construction, then we are matrix A then is becomes a square matrix because then it's just the rows are K different rows based on the color that we're pulling from. And then the criteria is that we're just pulling all balls on the same color. It may not be tenable at first, but it still provides the criteria of what happens if such sample could be constructed. So we let this S sort of bold S be the sample of balls. So S1, S2, all the way to SK from the colors one to K, where the sum of those are equal to, the sum of the S of I values are equal to the sample size, non-bold S, where, bold, where S is at least one. So like most of the time we're gonna be talking about greater than one because those are cases that are, are unique to the literature that was done before with this, you know, we're trying to go beyond the single ball case, but it is worthy to note, and I'll make a note of this little in a little bit later that like 
this stuff actually does will will still um, basically simplify to the general S equals one case as well. These affine urns is just an extension. We'll assume the urn is balanced. So in being balanced means the the sum of the entries of each of the rows of a replacement matrix M is equal to some balance factor, we call it B, for all the samples, no matter what we draw. So in doing that, it makes it a little bit easier for the analytical component, namely that the total number of balls in the urn is just now a function of the number of draws that we have, as well as our starting condition. So for example, if I let this tau sub N be the total number of balls at the urn, uh, a nice way to, to keep in mind is like this tau sub n actually is just the number of balls, the initial condition, plus b times the number of draws that we've had. So that, that is another way to simplify our function. To determine the number of balls in each of these colors. So we have a random row vector, we'll call it x sub n in bold be the number of colors for color one through color K after sample N. So basically, this is the structure of the urn after we draw in number of balls. We'll denote um, the sigma F sub N to be the sigma field generated by the first N samples. And the way that we consider an urn to be affine, so it's more of an if and only if situation as opposed to not every replacement matrix that we have can be considered to be an affine in nature. To make this affine condition actually hold itself into place, it's linear or an affine in nature if the sample that we obtain and the replacement criteria that comes from that sample is then a function, a linear function of basically the proportions. So we have for each of the cases where we draw only balls of color one, only balls of color two, all the way to only balls of color K. This becomes a linear um, combination of basically the proportions of these ball, of these replacement criterions from drawing all the same. And it can be simplified as a, as a more matrical um, construction of Basically, we take our sample, we multiply by our core matrix, and we get, and we say it's all over one over S. And in doing so, based on the sigma field that's coming beforehand, we can then find the conditional um, expectation of X sub N is the origin, what happened beforehand. So like basically, whatever the construction was at X sub N minus one, multiplied by an identity matrix plus this um, fractional proportion of one over tau sub n minus one times our A matrix. So we get, this is where the linearity kind of comes into place where you see that it's our original vector, our, our previous vector times a linear function of the A matrix that we com compose. Now, it's worthy to note that, you know, we could go beyond the idea of just a linearity. We could try to create function or create earn models that go to a squared, a cubed or whatnot. The real issue that comes from something like that and what makes this linearity um, much more malleable is the fact that this linearity, when we, we sort of factor it all out and decompose it, is something that is a lot easier to see the, the unraveling and decomposition as opposed to when we get to a higher power for the possibility for A. So to sort of you know, take what I talked about in a more theoretical sense and give a good example, here's an example of affine construction. So for example, let's say we have S equals three balls and we consider the affine urn with a replacement matrix developed by our core matrix. So a good way to think about this is like, well, if we can find the connection that comes from M to A, that's great. Oftentimes we may want to, to try to develop these affine urns. It's a more look into what would happen if I have our core matrix A, and can that be extrapolated to a, a replacement matrix, depending on the sample size that we obtain to develop our end replacement criterion. So in our case, we say, basically say this is what happens when we draw all balls of color one, 
Second row is all balls of color two. Third row is what happens when we draw all balls of color three. And so we'll take for a quick example, if I were to draw, it's, this happens when we, this is what happens when we draw all balls of just one respective color. But if we have something where we want to draw, let's say two balls of color one, one ball of color two, and no ball and nothing from color three, then we can get the S1 is two, S2 is one, S3 is zero. And we can find that the replacement criteria that should be for this sample for matrix M we can plug in our respective values and get that the replacement criteria on here then would be that if I were to draw a sample of two from color one, one from color two, zero from color three, that we would be adding four balls of color one, two balls of color two, three balls of color three. In general, we, th we consider, so we consider the, the rows for M to be constructed in a way that like gives us some language that everyone can, can utilize. So we opted to use the reverse lexicographic order. Um, it's proposed by Scott Consum and outlined as algorithm L with Knuth. And this process, we then are able to form the matrix, taking our core matrix A, we can create our replacement matrix as such. So note that here, this is the, for 300 zero, zero for M, that's just the same case as for A prior, because what's really happening is these two ball, these two criteria are gonna have zero over three, zero over three, and they basically go away. So, and this is three over three, so they align with each other perfectly so that we still get the same criteria for A pulled from these values and then the other components would then be linear combinations of however many the proportions are coming from the sample. There is something, you know, there is something worthwhile to keep in mind is that the construction for the, these matrices, well, I'm using A as a basics because I think it's the easiest to visualize the idea of drawing all from color one, all from color two, all from color three. There are other ways to generate this matrix M. And really all you need are three vector, three sample vectors from this sort of partition I have here of the rows that are coming from this piece. All you need is a linearly independent combination of the three. And that should allow you to construct through essentially what you'd have to do is then rework find a and then go back so it's like you can go straight to a and do it in once in one set of steps or you'd have to go take any linearly independent combination that sort of forms a basis for our our simplex of three different values of three different colors in this case and if we're able to find that then we can go ahead and find the other rows if necessary Ideally, go ahead and use A because then it's just going straight up from there. And when S is one, the replacement matrix then becomes just equal to the core matrix. So when S is one, then all these values are just 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and all the other rows in between sort of collapse on itself. So really when I talk about these affine earn models, I'm also talking about their traditional S equals one case that comes through. Also worthy to note is like, essentially what these earned are um, qualitatively. So I'm talking about all these things in a very quantitative and mathematical structure, but to think about it in a conceptual framework, these are multiple sample earns with the idea of the adage, you know, the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. So in this situation, as we sort of see here with this construction, that really what we're doing is we're finding what happens at each of these sort of um, monocolor samples that we're pulling from. And we're saying, based on whatever structure happens from these monocolor samples, we're getting a fractional portion of each of those samples that can come together to found our matrix M. Now the construction we talk about then considers to be the class of this, what we call KSB earn schemes. K being the colors, S being the sample size, B being the balance 
number that we get. To preserve tenability, we'll assume that the tau sub zero is always going to be greater than or equal to s. Um, and in general, really, it's the tau sub n is greater than or equal to s for all n. And that the, all the entries for the a sub i's are going to be non-negative when i is equal or not equal to j. So basically on the off diagonal of our capital A matrix. And that the a sub i i values are at least negative s values. So basically what happens is if I draw all balls of color one, then the most that I, I am allowing to have negative values, negative entries in our matrix and along this diagonal, but the most that I can pull from our matrix is s, basically saying that I'll never accidentally pull more balls from color s um, than, or I won't accidentally pull more balls of color one through color k than what I'm actually drawing out based on the sort of fractional representation I was talking about from each of these perspective samples. This nice, this assumption, and there may be other ones that sort of work through this, but one of the nice things that makes this assumption um, most preferable is that this construction makes A, what we know, the metzler leontief matrix, basically the matrix where it's non-negative except for along the diagonal. Um, we can then construct, reconstruct it basically as a difference of a non-negative matrix and um, minus, uh, in this case, minus S times an identity matrix, which is also considered to be non-negative. And one of the things that makes this, and I think I may talk about it in a second, what makes this nice is that um, we have two non-negative matrices and then eventually talk about irreducibility, which means we can start using like prone Frobenius theorems that come from this. So results are most easily obtained when the core of the replacement matrix is what we call irreducible. If an urn is irreducible, then we have that even if the urn is filled initially with balls of a, only a single color, there exists a route, no matter what, to which all other possible colors can appear in the urn based on the structure we've created. So essentially, we have this idea that they commute with or communicate with one another, and that in this construction, we're going to have um, value or we're going to have things that essentially, as in lemma, if this thing is considered irreducible in sort of that sort of earned sense, then the core matrix A is irreducible in the matrix sense. So we can actually start using the irreducibility of linear algebra and matrices to, uh, to utilize this irreducibility and then basically apply the perone theorem. So as an affine earn, the structure then becomes based essentially on this, the square core matrix A when we can analyze to its eigenvalue. So before, when we deal in multiple samples, we have this particular matrix. The eigenvalue deconstruction doesn't really work the same way that we would think about it in the S equals one case. But because essentially our sample then becomes a linear combination, I think I put it in an earlier slide where it basically constructed through our vector S times our core matrix A, if we can decompose this core matrix A, which is square, then to its eigenvalue decomposition, we can basically rehash the eigenvalue approach and sort of give us analytic solutions. Since the urn is balanced, the core matrix A and B and L matrix will going, is going to have a leading value equal to B itself. It's, it's the maximum of the rows. And it's always going to be strictly greater than um, the real part of the second leading eigenvalue in the irreducibility case. And so from this result, we'll be able to determine me the mean and analyze the covariances sort of based on the core index. We'll explore growing irreducible urns in this case where B is greater than zero using our core index that we have provided. So the core index is defined. So Many of you all who have studied urns under one ball would think of the, just the index as the second, the real part of the second leading out eigenvalue divided by the real part of the first leading eigenvalue from our replacement matrix M. We now think about it as a core index, which basically is this sort of um, index value for the core matrix. So in our case, because it should be just a regular B, my apologies. Um, 
the real part is just be itself. This is not the curse of be necessarily, uh, but the real part of the second eigenvalue. So whatever that value would be, we can then get the matrix to look accordingly. And we have three different cr criteria that kind of comes from this analytic uh, um, partition that kind of comes through all this stuff. One, when we have indice, a core index to be small, uh, when it's less than a half, one case when it's critical, and that's when it's equal to a half specifically, and one when we have it's a large where it's greater than a half. Now note that based on this structure that irreducibility would mean that no matter what, because the real part of uh, the real part of the second I leading eigenvalue is never going to be equal to the first part, then the, the, the a large situation for irreducible or it's, it means that it's always going to be less than one, but then greater than one half. When I talk about special decom decomposition, I sort of reference the idea that uh, for each of these eigenvalues in the spectral spectrum of A, that we'll have a projection matrix that commutes with A and satisfies these properties where we have uh, the projection matrix that associates with this whatever lambda is in our spectrum, as well as the nilpotent matrix that sort of goes alongside with this. We'll define this sort of new sub lambda to basically be the integer equal to one less than the size of the largest Jordan block of lambda. We'll denote for simplicity that um, new sub two is just the new of the lambda sub two. And this is important in the idea where we may have eigenvalue, second leading eigenvalues. Um, there is an ordering that um, can be constructed, but really the real parts are essentially interchangeable when they have, because typically if they aren't all just real values, they could be complex eigenvalues, then if they are leading ones, they're really complex conjugates of one another to specific multiplicities. And then if we produce an ordering for the eigenvalues of A, so that basically this is sort of the ordering that I talk about, then if A, J is sort of larger than I in this case for our eigenvalues, and that tells us that the real part of lambda sub i is then strictly is greater than the real part of lambda sub j, and that lambda one is a simple is simple when a is irreducible. And we'll let this v sub one be our principal left eigenvalue, basically the eigen or eigenvector, the eigenvector that's related to lambda one. For a covariance matrix, we can define the integral as such, where we eventually will have it be constructed through this idea of we have this we have our projection matrix, but we also have what we call this sort of p hat, where it's basically the identity matrix minus the projection matrix associated with lambda one. We also have this b matrix, which is then um, a a function of our sample size s through core replacement matrix a, and then the diagonalization. And so like this is basically turning our for our leading eigenvector into a square k by k matrix where it's zero off the diagonal and on the diagonal, it's just um, b sub one. So basically taking it and diagonalizing it to a square matrix. And we look, look at e raised to the z bold a power is sort of done in a Taylor series using um, matrix ideas where we basically have the infinite sum, raise this here and put it over that power. Well, denote, we can denote the operator um, nabla to denote backwards differences. And so at draw in, we can sort of see what happens as we transition. And we we're able to say like x1 minus x sub in, or x1 x sub n minus x sub n minus one basically becomes sort of this Q sample matrix. I should have five, my apologies. Um, this is basically the random sample that we're pulling from. So instead of using S, we think of it as terms of a random sample that we're pulling from. We will denote it Q sub n that follows a hypergeometric, multivariate hypergeometric distribution when we sample without replacement and then with replacement becomes a multinomial distribution. And so can, given it like this, this A matrix pulls out, it becomes something that has based on uh, the means of 
either the multivariate hypergeometric distribution or the multinomial distribution will still end up constructing to get one over tau sub n minus one times your previous case of x sub n minus one times a matrix. And we'll define this sort of y value. And essentially we're doing this because we wanna treat this as, um, we eventually wanna turn this, eventually the, the nebula sub or del sub y sub n, del of y sub n as a martingale differences. But this is also measurable as just basically a function of something that is the difference of them minus the minus sort of what we have here. And we're basically creating this factor in this part so we can get it to where if I take the, the conditional expectation of y sub n, this gives us zero. So we start having things that can unravel fairly easily. And the recurrence then becomes x sub n times what we see here as our values and then plus the y sub n. We can utilize the following matrix products uh, where this is just a function of basically what happens is you unravel at each stage. So if I use start basically at F sub zero, then it unravels um, the changes or the average changes that we're seeing of our, of our matrix to from the beginning to step in and basically utilizing this as a polynomial put into a matrix sense. Based on the fact that this is equal to zero, we can take our expectations and get that these that this mu sub n, the average, then can unravel all the way back down. So we we'll take the condition from f sub n minus one, f sub n minus two, and so on. And we can go ahead and back up utilizing this matrix here to then become a matter of this um, sort of F matrix that we, we've defined. And this is where we get a little sneaky. We're able to take then, we'll basically add an identity matrix in between. It doesn't do anything uh, other than sort of just adding, you know, it's like the, multiplying by one in a matrix sense. But by doing, by doing this, I, we can then decompose I all the way back to when I was talking about spectral decomposition as the sum of these projection matrices that we're pulling from. So all this does is basically take the sum. These values are not the X sub zero and the F sub zero in do not rely on lambda. So then we can treat this as the sum of, you know, of a function of our projection matrices. When one of the lambda I, or one of the eigenvalues is not equal to lambda one, we're able to utilize you know an extension of what was done uh, in Janssen's 2020 work, where we're able to talk about how like anything lower than that basically shrinks down to an eigenvalue or um, to 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 an asymptotic power that is less than, or at most a half. And then, so when it's equal to one, we can look at the case of just when this one is sort of break it down into what it becomes through various lemmas that we can see that will eventually breaks it down to the B sub n plus tau sub zero, basically the number of steps of the tau sub n component times your leading eigenvalue based on a lot of stuff in the background. And then taking this component, which is essentially at most one half, but could be a little bit less depending on if it's small um, for something that is crit small or critical. And then the extra pieces here, then the mean actually becomes just sort of this, sort of line, this function asymptotically uh, equivalent to however many balls are in the balance that we're adding each time times n plus tau sub zero times your leading eigenvalue based on a. The sense of time, uh, we're outlining sort of the covariance. We can construct the covariance. It can't, it's a little convoluted, so I sort of just outline the pertinent results here. Utilizing that matrix, that, that integral matrix I had here, if the core index is small, then as n starts going to infinity, 
this the covariance matrix then will converge to that inner goal that we saw. And then if it's critical, if the lem, if you know, the critical index and the core index is critical, then it will converge to this uh, summation of essentially a combination of that B matrix that I provided, as well as all the other sort of pieces of the puzzle for dealing with the null, the, the nullity, the nil potent matrix, as well as the projection matrices that are coming through. You can then take this Y that I, I briefly mentioned and utilize this as this sort of del Y as a martingale differences. And through that, we're able to pull into U for the small and critical urn core indices. We're able to actually get a multivariate central limit theorem and provide that just like in the single value case, we're able to provide a solution to to where the distribution should be going to based on a scaling and relocating and get a multivariate normal distribution where this, this factor, the scaling factor is then dependent on whether or not it's small or it's critical and the, cor the correlation, uh, the covariance matrix is then dependent on that. Quick discussion of hyper-recursive trees. Um, is a great example of that where I can go ahead and I take basically cases where I have, instead of just having an edge that connects two vertices, I can do a hyper edge or connects more at most or two or more vertices where I randomly sample um, theta minus one. So I choose some sort of value. We start off with theta um, initial vertices and then I sample beta minus one to find it, make it equally likely. And I can create this sort of random, uh, random hyper recursive tree that then can evolve in its own right, where at every stage I'll add another vertex and then add another hyper edge according to it. And it's original, it's a re regular recursive tree when the parameter is theta th equals two. In um, Sparks, Balaji and Mahmood, we talk about the idea of local and global profiles and containment with hyper graph models, hyper crystal trees. And the local level is the number of hyper edges in a given vertex. In a global level, you want to often determine the probabilistic pattern by the raw count of the number of vertices at a particular containment level. Doing it without affine urns becomes very complicated and it has a combinatorial explosion that comes through it because everything kind of becomes a boots, bootstraps on these lower levels and it just explodes. So like in our situation with global profiles, in this case, at each of these stages, theta equals three, tau one is four, tau two is five. Um, for the number of vertices with two, one hyper edge, in this case, at the second stage, there's just one of them. And when there's two of them, there's one, two, three, four, and so we have two hyper edges there. We can relate these things, however, to affine urns. I'll try to make it a little bit quicker, where we create the first K levels, uh, global containment levels of X to be equal to this sort of affine urn structure where it's Y, and then saying everything else, we're going to create it as this K plus one color. We're then able to construct this sort of A matrix for, for our Y, it looks like this, that is affine in nature. And it has a core index of negative, negative theta minus one. So it's a negative value and it will be small in nature. So through recursion or through you know, using the decomposition of A, you can see the mean is then can be asymptotically represented as such. And the covariances then become an application of the affine urns, and we can get specific value entries for this is for the two containment levels. And we can go beyond that based on just creating a matrix that I provided A before and then running through the motions of the small cases of affine urns. Getting a central limit theorem that is essentially applying the work that we that was seen in Mahmoud and Smythe in 1992. We're able to do this now with uh, mul 
having multiple samples a hyper recursive tree. I do a couple of simulation, and then I, my apologies, I will be, I'll be done in a couple minutes. Uh, we do a couple of simulations where I go ahead and I take, I basically am drawing a number of values and I can simulate these urns pretty easily and then create um, estimated some mu hat values for our, what we expect that the, the, these values should converge to, as well as get uh, values for the for the covariance matrix. And so for some examples, do so there's an affine urn matrix um, where there's two draws per sample. And so we're able to get breaking down A, this becomes a small urn because we have an eigenvalue decomposition where these values are that the second eigenvalue is strictly less than half than the first one. The principal eigenvector then becomes um, provided as such. And so for at large n, we expect that these values should be roughly about, if I take this and divide by n, that we get this sort of mu value, so the, the rough average proportion values for these things should be roughly about you know, 3.7, 5.5, 16.9. Based on the replacement criteria, and so this 16 here is because 6 plus 4 plus 6 gives a 16 of a balance factor of 16. We can also do all this sort of nasty work that you see here and get um, our deconstruction to see what would happen to what we expect these values to end up being and get a central limit theorem where a co the mean is equal to this and the covariance matrix is equal to this. And the theoretical values provided here, um, rounded to three decimal places, this theoretical values, but with the simulation results, for whether we're sampling from model R or from model M with a out replacement, we get values that is pretty much align, not too far off, even at a uh, simple. So here I'm just doing it 2,000 draws and do 1,000 replications to get our examples. And can I see that like, given these things, we see the normality easily beginning to form for each of these colors and that the distribution doesn't seem too far off. And what makes this nice is that whether or not we're dealing with, um, for small and critical cases, whether we're dealing with or without replacement, it basically will go and converge the similar thing, similarly without any sort of reweighting that goes through. For a critical case, we see for this situation, we get that the balance factor is six, the principal eigenvalue, the, so we're here, the real part here is three, so three is half of six, and that the principal that the eigenvector is equal to a third times just the one vector, so one third, one third, one third. This value, this construction and com computationally will then reduce to this matrix here for a covariance matrix, and we see that it'll converge to the, to the trivariate multi or trivariate normal distribution. And we can go ahead and see the, here are our cases, what we expect it to be for this mu sub infinity, sigma sub infinity. And we get values that also fall in line and we can sort of see that this becomes normal as well, just with a slightly different scaling factor because we're having to deal with adding an ln associated to it. And the hyper recursive trees, here are some examples for the first two containment levels whether theta is from two to five, and you can see what these specific values should be, as well as the approximate covariance matrix values, and then the estimates that come through, and then through looking at things both through a Shapiro-Wilk at a univariate uh, normal test, as well as um, the HZ test for multivariate normality, all these things, um, the p-values here, are you know, failing to reject that we, we still retain the normality assumption isn't being violated here. And simulation, also at this case, you can kind of see even at the at 2000 draws that these hyper recursive trees seem to follow the normal distribution. This idea deals with a foundation of affine urns, random structures and represented by them. There's different studies linking you can also look at the idea of irreducible classes. That's basically these super colors like blues and greens. This takes the situation where we do have colors to do not communicate with one another, but maybe communicate within subgroups. 
And that's where you see things that sort of came through with Kuba and Shen in I think 2000, I think there's one like 2005 and then so probably 20 years ago at this point. Uh, also earned the activity, so balls were not equally likely to be selected in preferential treatment. And I didn't really talk about it this much for because we're about time, but there's also the idea of large core indices. Um, in large core indices, what we do get is that we have something that can, we have almost sure convergence to our mean, but getting the covariance matrix, it's a little bit more complicated because it also depends on the initial sample size. So the nice part about these small and critical earns is that initial sample size actually doesn't matter, but with large sample sizes or large earns and then this sort of scalar irreducible classes, the initial sample size does matter and they sort of break it down as like what Raul Gould did um, where it becomes sort of this combination of our, our eigenvectors that are above one half. And then what seems to be done by Mueller uh, suggests that we have something that looks like it's roughly we have these sort of gamma functions that if I pull those off and peel it back like an onion, then we can eventually get a normal distribution that comes through. So plenty of new routes still beyond this piece to have a ball. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lucia, for the, this nice talk. Uh, are there some uh, questions, please? Okay. Some questions, please. I have uh, so in your uh, work here, you give the asymptotic distribution only for uh, small earns. Oh, and the... critical, and critical ones. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, and your um, your sample size is deterministic. But yes, but every time if you go to slide, I think slide five or six, where you have the martingale expected value of uh, x n given f n minus one equal to one uh, i plus a uh, divided by tau n minus one, I think. <laughs> My apologies. Way back here. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, go on. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Equation oh, one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so that, that you need is only equation one. Uh, is only the ex conditional expectation of xn uh, given fn minus one. So mm -hmm. if you, you take a, a random sample you, mm -hmm. uh, that you need is only the condition expectation of the random sample given fn minus one. So if you take, uh, 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 okay, sample size. If you take the sample size random, you need mm -hmm. only the condition expectation of the size of this uh, sample given fn minus one. So if, if you, I think you can. I think there is a, yeah, I think that would be. Okay. I, I think that these results can be extend to the case where you have uh, balanced errors, but uh, your uh, mm -hmm. sample size is random. Okay. Due to this remark. I think so. In the sense of, so I think, Yes, I think it would be interesting to take this to this work. Essentially, what we end up doing, though, because our sample size is random, we no longer have sort of, let's see if I can find, where is it? There we go. So now we, so when we deal with this, then it, this becomes sort of a M sub lowercase s, where s is now, that or non-bolded s. So the sample size, so, we have to now make sure that for this random sample size S, each mm -hmm. of those urns are then, I think, affine in nature. So like when S, so if we say that we have, even there's a very easy thing where like half the time S is two and half the time S is three. Okay. So this random sample size, I think we have to make sure that M sub two and M sub three both fulfill the affine nature component. 
Okay. And I think that's possible. I don't think that's a, uh, I don't think it's an issue. Like, so admittedly, when I create examples for these ones, I cheat a little bit because I know that if one of the ways to easily cheat is that if you know, if I make all these entries multiples of our sample size, then I know that I don't have to worry about the, like by creating this matrix and where like, if it's three, if I make these all multiples of three, then I know that I can construct an M from that. So if I wanted something that where it's two half the time, three half the time, if I make a, a core matrix that is six, multiple, all the entries here are multiples of six, I know that M sub two and M sub three would both be viable. Okay. It's just more, so I think what you're saying works. It's not a problem. It's just a matter of, and I think I, I briefly mentioned it uh, at the beginning, where it's like, the problem here is if I want to restrict our entries to um, integers, it becomes, mm -hmm. there's a very, there's like a lot of nuance on whether or not A can directly can conduct or construct an M because there may be fractional components. Now there are, I don't think that's much of an issue if we, I think it's easy to generalize what we have here to the idea of maybe fractional amounts. So maybe it's not number of balls, but like proportions of quantity that we add onto it. If we're pulling, if we pull something from there, I think that's via, I don't think it should be too much of an issue. And I think from there it'd be, much easier to do what you're saying where you have like the random balls being drawn. So like you can't draw a ball unless there's a full proportion of it maybe, but also so like as long as there's, you know, if it's somewhere between 1.0 and 1.99, then you can still pull a ball of that color or something like that. I think that would be pop. I don't, I don't see restrictions immediately as an issue. Okay, thank you. And and the, the, the eigenvalues of uh, your matrix lambda one, lambda two, and so on, are ordered uh, with respect to the real parts. Yes, they're all respect. Yeah, all respect, the real part of lambda one, lambda two, and so on. The nice part is that lambda okay. one is always going to be equal to, in okay. this balance case. Oh, okay. and and in some slides you have a summation over the eigenvalues. Uh, with real parts equals to b over two. We are sure we are sure that we we have some eigenvalues with real parts equal to b uh, half of b. That is the critical case. Yes. So if I I'll pull it up. So in the critical case, so when it's critical, that's when this this ratio is equal to a half. Well, yes, that happens yes. when yes. rent is equal okay. to b over two. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think that Cyril Bondry has uh, a remark. Uh, can you give a remark direct, your remark directly, Cyril? Yes, yeah. okay. So, hello. Thank you. So, thanks hello. For hello. And yes, a little question, uh, well, two little questions. So, so it is often the case that for um, limit distribution for urns, the limit distributions are um, some types of variants of metal gaffer distributions. Quite often, uh, because if you pump the moments, you have some type of hypergeometric recurrences. Mm -hmm. And so do you have examples of such non-Gaussian limit loss for your uh, model, uh, possibly related to some metal gaffler? So when you're, so one of the things that comes from this, uh, at least in this, I, so in this class, we have construction of, you know, like what you said, it's, there are the sample size is deterministic each time, and then the balance factor is deterministic. When we're small and critical, it'll go to normal. When we have large, what essentially, and this is, we're still working on getting analytic solutions. Simulation results suggest that what we have going on here um, for when it's large is that, uni at least univariately, um, we get that each color converges through scaling and whatnot and relocating, that it becomes a gamma-like distribution. And so 
what we are seeing is that we see some sort of mixture distribution based on the colors that are not, or so the eigenvalue, so the, the colors that have eigenvalues that are, or the eigenvalues are, so like if there are like two or three colors where the eigenvalues are greater than a half, or the real parts are greater than a half of B. So the, the, then those vectors essentially will converge to not necessarily the same type of gamma that we see when uh, when S is one, we'll get some sort of mixture component. And I think Shen and Kuba kind of talk about this, uh, this idea where everything is its own sort of creature. So like basically a K. Is it more some gamma or some products of gamma or even some powers of gamma? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's powers of gamma. I think uh, Mueller was able to show that it's just a mixture of mm -hmm. gamma distributions, basically a sum of these sort of gamma distributions. Because uh, it, yes, because mm -hmm. some of those transformations can in fact be related to some metal defler also. Mm -hmm. so the, the, but yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for the, the stuff that you showed at the very end, uh, your simulations, it was cases which were proven to be uh, Gaussian or not? Yes, yes. So all those are small and critical in nature. So that's where we get that. Okay, so, so this is what proven. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have some simulation work. I probably, if we have some time, I can pull up some things that I have tucked away that have the simulations <laughs> for um, the gamma distributions for the larger cases. So like, the problem is it's not necessarily equal to the proportion. So like in previous work, especially when S is one, we're seeing that like it's typically like proportionate, the 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 fat the parameters for the gamma distribution and are or the Dirichlet distributions that are semi Dirichlet distributions that come from there um, are proportionate to basically the, the initial starting conditions. So it's basically the initial color over the sum of the total. So it's like, uh, act, so for each of these, if I take it, yes, then it's for like- For it is always the case that there is high dependency on the initial conditions. It's really mm -hmm. a, key, a key problem. So do, do you have on your slides a simulation, uh, let's say the simplest simulation for which the limit distribution is still open? So, let me, oh, it's still open? Um, no, but I can pull one up. And in, in parallel, uh, last question. So did you also consider the partial differential equations associated to these models and uh, the nature of the of the solutions, the, the generating functions, if they have some nice features or not? I haven't necessarily looked at it in a in this case. So work that was I had done with uh, Sam Mahmoud a while back, we use partial differential equations to consider cases when it's continuous in nature. So like one of the things that makes, we can use the partial, the PDEs uh, for um, instead of discrete schema, we consider um, continuous processes. So polyproprocesses, processes, for example, and whatnot. That's something that often will utilize the PDE. I think that's a nice next sort of step in a turn that I'd like to play around with some time in as I go forward, yeah. Yes, okay, but but in fact, the the, the PDEs, as far as the PDE point of view, could be used also for the discrete setting. Huh? If you play with the history of the urn, you have some differential think... operators which is uh, mimicking the evolution of the urn, and therefore you have uh, some partial differential equations which in full generality uh, is a big class that we don't know how to solve. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lots of uh, funny equations. But in some cases, the nice model of Ernst leads to some miracle. And the, in those cases, we are able to solve them and we get some more insights or we can pump the moments. So it's usually what is happening. And I won't be surprised here that if also the, the PDA point of view could lead to some recurrences for the moments. Le, le, but then, for sure, to, to identify from this what is the limit distribution, it's also some work. Mm -hmm. So here is 
and samples. So this is, so in this case, situation, I think this is the case where all of them are reinforcing. So it's like an extension of the poly process or the poly urns where if I draw a ball of color one, I add U balls of color one to it. So it's self-reinforcing. So in our case, it's then becoming a situation where like if I draw, if I have say S is three, if I draw three balls of color one, then I'm adding those U balls to it. So in this case, this is one where I did it where like it's not, so this scale beta is what would be in the case of S equals one. And then sort of the took essentially estimates that I was sort of playing or more, this is more like exploring and estimating for playing around with it. It looks like it's following a beta distribution. I'm not sure what prompts specific values quite yet. It's still, still playing around to X2 where like you can essentially ignore the one. It's more, that was more of a counter example to show that it's not the same as the S equals one case. But we can see that this black distribution line follows pretty closely to what we see as a scaled beta for each of these things. So then if I put it together, it becomes a mixture or even just like... Uh, way you got the, the parameters of the beta here? Part of it was, so the, the betas that I found in blue, um, I think I started off with using the sense of a proportion and then also exploring like adding, rescaling it to a factor of, depending on the sample size that we have it. So I think it's maybe like X plus S over T plus S or something like that. This is this is more like still an exploration state. So like not necessarily analytically, but like it seems like these are the, these parameters based on, it seemed to be some function of X sub zero and each of the responding Respond, um, corresponding colors, um, tau sub zero, and then the sample size S to sort of, it seems to fl as we see as it like flattens and stretches it out a little bit more depending on your sample sizes. So this is what we're seeing in those cases. So, okay. So in those cases, so you mm -hmm. conjecture a, a beta limit low with those parameters, but it's still mm -hmm. open. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. For sure. Other questions, please? Maybe the last question. Uh, uh, you have an essential uh, assumption that uh, your urn is balancing. Every time you mm -hmm. add the same number of balls. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we replace this assumption by the fact that at every time n, I add tn balls, where tn is a sequence of ID random variables, mm -hmm. okay? Maybe we, we can use the strong law of large numbers to, to extend the, these results in this case. I think so. Um, because the, I the, think... the total number of balls, uh, when N is large, become uh, due to the strong law of large numbers, numbers uh, deterministic, N multiplied by the mean of T. Mm -hmm. I think what may, at the end, I think that's fine. What makes it trick? It, so I think if I didn't have any criteria on M, the M matrix itself, I think, and I think like even like, and I think it's even been done in a stochastic approximation sense. Like they, they found mm -hmm. solutions that deal with it in that set, in that case. With the, the affine urns, at least trying to get into an analytic situation, what makes this trickier, and I don't think it's, a, it's not impossible. I think it's just the idea that one, so if they're not, so if it's like averaging based on some situation here, I think, talk about a, here we go. So if these are starting to be different, I think one of the issues that come through is, I think that like the leading, I think the leading eigenvalue still becomes the maximum of the rows that could be constructed through there. Finding M then becomes something that I think 
should be fine in that M is no longer row balanced. So as long as we can construct that, that should be okay. And I, th I think the, the trickiest part is I think there are cases when you don't have these being equal to each other that we just have to be careful of sort of strange situations on the eigenvalue deconstruction. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I think like at least in the S equals one case, uh, there are cases where like when they're not equal, it's possible, but like you have to have other conditions so that the thing okay. Sure. Nicely. Oh, the questions, please. If new, we have to, to thank you again, uh, Dr. Russia, for this nice talk. Thank you to all the public and uh, see you uh, next uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Russia. Thank you all. <laughs>